This is Wedding DJ School, your guide to the business of a wedding DJ. We're talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. You're going to hear their backstories, how they got started, and where they are today. It's Josh Mitchell, and I'm honored to host and be here with you to talk about building a business that is bigger than yourself. Before we get to today's show, I want to take a second to remind you of the free resources you can get sent over to your inbox. In season one of the podcast, we talked in depth about some of the items that aren't typical when it comes to starting a business, things like the right way how to say no. Yes, there's a right way how you can say no, how to stay resilient so you can keep going and recover after a tough experience, and and other tips so that you can avoid making costly mistakes. You can get all of those resources sent to you for free. All you have to do is send a quick text message over to the number 44222. Just write the word wedding DJ in the message and then we'll ask for your email and then we'll send you access to all of that material just as a way of saying thank you for listening to Wedding DJ School. All you have to do is text wedding DJ, all one word, to the number 44222. Well, for today's show, we're headed over to Johnson City, Tennessee to talk to Stacy Carroll. She has a phrase that I love, and it's something that we can all learn from called celebration facilitation. And that's what we've titled today's show, because that's really the heart of what it means to be a wedding DJ, to literally facilitate a celebration. So if you get nothing more out of today's episode, it's this simple yet powerful truth that we exist to facilitate celebration. But it gets better. You're going to hear some of her key learnings over the years and how she continues to stay in the game as an entertainer. I hope you enjoy today's show. So my name is Stacy Carroll, and I'm based out of Johnson City, Tennessee. And the name of my business is Stacy Randy DJ. And we're coming up on almost 14 years now this spring. So it's it's been a while. <laughs> and so what I do... Um, well, I've, I've been a DJ this whole time and have taken on the role of MC the past few years. And so I specialize in weddings, but I also do several other different types of events as well. Tell me a little bit more about some of those other events that you do. So, well, I love the art of DJing and, and mixing and making creative sets. And so I, I do really, really a, a variety of events. And I've, I've done everything from big, large phone parties to small kids' birthday parties. And I also do princess appearances. I'm a, a singer and actress. And so I, I do a, a little bit of everything in the entertaining side. So why do you do this? Like, like what got you into this? Like, what, what is the kind of motivation for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been a musician basically my whole life and also a dancer. And so we actually, we started out in a band. I was in various bands throughout and I joined my husband's band. And whenever the, the band ended up breaking up, we had a wedding planner contact us about the band playing for a reception. And I'm not even sure how the conversation got started, but I had kind of started DJing and where I bought some DJ software and I would kind of mix some dances together. I also taught group fitness at the time. So I would make these CDs to play for my aerobics classes. And then I also had like dance mixes that I would make. I taught hip hop dance back then. And so whenever the band would take breaks, then we would play these dance mixes that I made during the band's breaks. And so that conversation went somehow. I was like, well, band's not together, but we have all this equipment. We've basically been DJing, so we'll DJ this wedding. Like we, they've done, you know, the the band, they were together for, I think, 12, had been doing it for 12 years already at that time. So, I mean, it was something that there had been a lot of knowledge on before before I came along. And so from there, it just took off and then made it a career. And then within the past few years, and I've really dived into it and and really made it um, an, an art form and business together. Awesome. So tell me a little bit more about that first wedding that you did or the first kind of paid gig that you were doing as a DJ and, and kind of making that transition from kind of the live sound world into more of the DJ stuff. What was that like in the, in the beginning? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I was in college at the time, so I was big into going out to the dance clubs and dancing and, you know, all the, the, 
cool music and stuff that you want to dance to. So since I was in, like, whenever I was at my sorority, you know, it's always me and this one other girl. We were always people that were always on the dance floor. Like whenever everybody else wouldn't get on the dance, like I was, I was the party starter person. And so it's like, I knew all this music and stuff that would work. And just from my own personal experiences. So what's crazy is that that wedding almost 14 years ago, I wasn't nervous at all, but I get nervous now. Like, I, I guess I, I care more now, but it's like, oh, we just play all this fun music. And, and it went, I mean, it went fine. It was, I knew nothing compared to what I know now, but I mean, it was, and of course we were a lot cheaper and stuff, but I mean, it was, it was fine. And it was, uh, well, but really the transition from playing in the bars and clubs and the band and stuff. Cause I, well, the first, the first bar I played in, I made $80 that night and I thought, Oh my gosh, this is so much money. <laughs> so now it's like, there's no way I got over $80 in the whole day. But, but, um, and so it was, you'd stay up so late in all of the, those, those type of, of venues. And like, I, we would go home and eat breakfast and then go to bed. And so it got like, like, we can't keep doing this. And I was, I mean, I was a lot younger back then too. And so we did the, the weddings. It's like, oh, hey, you're getting so much more money and you're done by, you know, a normal hour <laughs> of the of the evening and you go home and, you, you know, they have all like a great environment and there's no crazy drunk people yelling at you. And it was like, it was just like, oh my gosh, we have to do weddings. And then and then from there, just kind of like, now that is what I specialize in. That's great. You mentioned the $80, and I'm sure that, you know, you could pay a lot more than that now. So what was that, <laughs> even in those early days when it was 80 or a little bit more than that, what was going through your mind when you realized, I can actually make money at this? Even though it wasn't a whole lot at the very beginning, what was kind of the, the thought process for you when you were like, wait a second, I can actually make money? Yeah, well, well, I mean, grow it. Growing up, you know, playing music, you always had to pay to play. So it was like, you know, you paid for your lessons. How you, know, you go to, like, I got to play at Hard Rock Cafe one time, but you know, my mom had to had to pay for me to go and play there, and I, everything. It was, you you had to put this into, it. and then you, then you got to perform. So it's like I actually am making money. Like, I mean, of course, anything more than nothing was was a lot, and I didn't even think about you know, make it how, how it could make into or go into something more. Yeah. And I think for a lot of musicians, they sometimes think that, you know, oh, that they've got this big dream. And I think that that's fantastic. I think that's beautiful. I, I don't want to discourage that at all. I, I think big dreams mm -hmm. are, are great. But sometimes it can feel like a grind when you're not actually bringing in any of the cash. So what would you, how would you encourage a musician who's maybe at that point where they're feeling like they want to maybe make some money, but they're also pursuing this other dream? What, mm -hmm. what does DJing have to do with that? Or, or what could it mean for a person who's in that position? Yes. Well, really, you have to find what I don't want to say what you settle for because ultimately my dream back in the day was to be a rock star <laughs> and I don't want to say that I settled into DJing but it just progressed into that and now I have you know a balance where I have you know family and I don't have to worry about being on the road and and playing like how how we used to do and, and even back whenever we weren't making any money but it's you guess you just got to find out what's important to you and and if if making it like as, as a musician and all this stuff if if you are willing to sacrifice the other things so that that might be stay having to stay up all night for several nights and going around and, and not not being able to to settle down anywhere and and I'm not really sure where I'm going with this well, yeah, answer, but, sorry. but I also, <laughs> I um, am a musician as well, and I think that as a lot of early musicians um, on that beginning part of their journey think, you're like, okay, what if one day I'm playing in a big band, or what if one day, you know, I make it, and what if one day I, I kind of, you know, go go all out, and I think what I discovered as a musician is that DJing was this opportunity to actually make some real money to be able to fuel those passions, so I was able to use yeah. Yeah. the money from the DJ gigs to buy studio equipment, or to buy a guitar, or to buy mm -hmm. this or that, and now I'm married, and I'm thinking about, you know, our, our future, and it's able to provide for our family, it's able to provide for things like vacations, yeah. and, you know, some of those other things things. So it's like, 
Um, I think that, you know, uh, maybe that person right now that out there that is a musician, they actually might be a fantastic DJ and entertainer. And I'm thinking oh, yeah. if they're, if they're listening yeah. to your story, they, they might be encouraged to, you know, again, not settle, but it's like, look at this beautiful opportunity that, that you can find here in the DJ and entertainment industry. And I'm just curious how you. Yeah. And I, I think being a musician translates so well to DJing because there's so much math to music. So, you know, our, had been doing it for so long. I had you know, all these years of theory and did all these college classes. And so just knowing the math of music has made it so much easier to know how to, to mix songs and to the, you know, making everything that, that sounds so fluid. And so a lot more than just here's a song and it's a beat and going to the next song. So it's actually a, a creation. I mean, I think of it, I use my brain the same way that I did in songwriting. And also I'll touch on the kind of not giving up on your dreams a little bit. So I actually, I just bought some, I uh, used to be, you know, big into songwriting, songwriter. That was, you know, totally what I did. I only did originals in my, like an old, old, old band. And I've, I kind of had put that away for, you know, really once I've been DJing, but I got some new software and I'm getting back in, into, you know, producing now. So I'm, I'm going to put on back on or put back on my, songwriter hat and so i want to say it's never never too late to give up on your dreams <laughs> and so yeah, and we go through different phases and different seasons where, where we try different things. And, um, you know, that that's fantastic. So I just, yeah, I'm thinking of particularly as in this conversation with you that this idea of, of being a musician and an entertainer and a DJ, they might seem like all separate things, but really it's all one that's kind of under the same umbrella. And, um, and we probably need more musicians to become DJs because they're really, really good. Like you said, they're able to better mix songs together. They're able to feel the rhythm and the flow a lot better. They're able to think kind of thematically because they, they are actually interested in kind of the ingredients of what makes music good, not just whatever the DJ charts are telling you is going to be a hit. So I just, I, I find that so interesting in your story that because you were a musician, it gave you kind of a leg up being a DJ because you know a little bit more about the secrets behind what makes music good. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Especially, and, and even just from personal things are just enjoying dancing. Like as a person out there, like I know what, it, what would motivate me to, to want to move. And, and even you know, what I, I look at charts, like what, but I always like, listen, like, okay, what does this sound like? What's, does this have a, a motivating beat? Yes or no. I kind of, I do like a quick, like, do it. Does it pass my test or not? Just listening to it. Love it. I love it. And I think that that's, that's something that great DJs automatically build into their sets is that kind of energetic feeling of like, okay, I just need to dance to this. I just want to get out there and, and, um, and move. And it creates that energy and that excitement that people are looking for, especially at weddings. So what advice would you give to somebody or what advice would you even give to yourself if you were to go back to, you know, right when you first got in, into the, the DJ industry, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to somebody on the front end of their journey? So what I would say to anyone starting out or my younger self is really to, to get into the education and to meet as many DJs as you can to, to learn really to learn about so many more things. Cause whenever I went to my first conference, I'd been DJing for three two maybe two years when I went and it was just like my mind was just blown it's like I had no idea that any of this stuff was even possible so there's always something to learn so I think a lot of people really well, I know when I was younger and a musician I was just like I know everything like no one can tell me what to do and so just really learning and learning from other people that have been there longer than you have and just being open-minded that's really the biggest thing because that no one ever knows everything and someone always has something to offer even if you know if they have a hundred things they say and you only one of those only is what applies that's one more thing than what you had to begin with so really just just being open and, and wanting to learn and grow and improve what were some of those things for you that you thought that maybe coming into those events that you thought you had it figured out or you didn't know um, something, what was something that, that kind of clicked for you that you're like, wow, I'm so glad that I learned that. Yes. Well, I mean, honestly, well, um, well, Mark Farrell was who spoke 
on the first one, it was like about making this a living, which you never thought about. I was always like hundred dollars per hour. That was like a huge amount of money, but it's like, Oh, you're, you can actually, you know, make this a profession. So that, that was a big thing. Peter Mary also spoke. And, and so I did a lot of training with him just about how you can add to the whole experience. And like I did the professional process with him and, and also, um, I have a moment blank on his name, but who, who does all the games and stuff. So just learning about being interactive and stuff with the crowd. So lots of things of just taking it to the next level of, of making it a profession. So, and also just being on the, just talking to other people, just understanding chord management, which a lot of people talk. So, you know, the band, what was the band with the, you know, chords hanging down from the lights and, Lots of stuff that I didn't even think about. I looked at that first picture from my first wedding, and we had a tip jar out. I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> so, I mean, so, so much that you don't know that you don't know whenever you start out. What are some other mistakes that come to mind or just things that you're like, man, I can't believe I did that when I first was DJing? Yeah. Um, really, I guess just the lack of preparation. Um I used to have just like a piece of paper and I like wrote down the special songs and then you'd go and, and play them. And we had just like, well, we had CDs back then. So it was like no, nothing was even close to the level that I would want it to be now. But it was just like, here's a CD of these special songs and we'll just go on to the next. Like that's horrible to think about now. But. So now you prepare more. And so what are some things that yes. you've learned over the years that are just so essential to making your DJ business and the way that you run things? Like what are things that are important to you now that I know you mentioned um, some of the like the Mark Farrell stuff and the professional process. But what are some mm -hmm. of 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 your like, hey, I this I couldn't do a wedding without doing these things? Yes. Yeah. So for me, what I always say is it's the little details that you might not specifically notice but those are what make a huge impact so i always think of like pixar and the toy story movies there's all kinds of tiny little details that you don't realize unless you really look at it i mean the accuracy on like a like the toolbox how it's written i mean just all these little things and so that's what i love with with weddings and putting the the little things into music into really getting to know the couple and making it something that's super special so it's not just me coming in and playing these same songs all the time here's your you know top 200 wedding songs we're gonna play it over and over it's making it very very special to them but while still making it fun for everyone and just really really personalizing it and also um I want to say transitions of everything. So everything just works smoothly. So I always have like in between transition music too, if you need to like move, move to different things. Um, I guess kind of, kind of knowing your, your full timeline of, of everything and, and just making it flow and not something that seems awkward or just, just all, all the, I want to say I, I'm, I'm mixing songs. So I'm, I'm big into, getting to know like with with a request like I'm I'm one of those people and I'm so I posted on Instagram yesterday that I'm not afraid of requests like you can you can send me tons of requests like I, I don't mind I love getting to know, finding out what those songs are and but then mixing it so that it so that it's fun and that it can flow and especially there might be some songs or some songs I'll be like no you don't want this song but then other songs you know you can take out take just the chorus of it maybe or if you want to overlay it with something else and so you're you're getting that that's like oh yeah this was my sixth grade jam like I don't want to tell somebody that they can't play that. Well, that whenever I got married that was I DJ my own wedding because like I'm not going to trust some old guy to come in here and he's going to play all this corny music I like this is not what I want like here's the songs that I want and so I was like I'll just do it myself and so that's what I, I always see so many DJs like oh you're not going to tell me what to play I'm going to come in and like like not like I'm I'm going to listen to what they want. Like I'm going to make it so that it's good, but you know, if if they have something they want, like it's their wedding, like I want I want to make it what what they want it to be. 
Tell me a little bit more. You mentioned the <laughs> the old guy coming in playing a bunch of corny music. What are some other pet peeves or just things that are just plain wrong when other DJs do these kinds of things? Oh goodness. So, yeah. I mean, I'm really, I'm not someone that talks bad about people, but just some of the stuff I see that coming in with, uh, I talked about something else too. It was um, with your music note vest and cummerbund on and just making these really corny jokes. I mean, like, and almost some, I've seen some like kind of inappropriate jokes, like don't, don't talk about, don't joke about the wedding, not like that. I don't know. That's just kind of creepy to me. And and just, uh, really, I guess just just the the whole aesthetics of of that corny DJ type, like "Hello and welcome to the wedding." I mean, just like uh. <laughs> that's that's good. And there's like, or, or or I've seen, and or I see a lot of other like their wedding. The the picture for the advertising is just like a card table and a fold out chair, and then it's just. A computer and then it's like this is who you want to hire it's like that's what you're advertising with like no no <laughs> that's yeah that's a great takeaway um what's an area that you would not skimp when it comes to either equipment or advertising or just when you're thinking about investing into an entertainment and dj company what's an area that people should not skimp so i think it's really important to have a nice clean setup because with weddings, people, they're putting a lot of time and effort and thought and money into what they want their wedding to look like. So you don't want to come in and junk it up with like all this like crazy big giant speaker things and cords and things going in every direction and, and making it just look like not the style of what they're doing. So I would say, I mean, it doesn't have to be something expensive, but just make it neat. Even if even if you don't have like your own booth or something, have a, a table with a, you know, a fitted table skirt instead of just something like wrinkled up sitting on top, just making it neat and fit with the, the style of the wedding venue. That's yeah, that's so important. And it's, it's cheap to do that. Like you don't, like you said, you don't have to spend a ton of money and go out and buy the most expensive, you know, like custom built table with wood accents and uplighting and all of that. You can do it with, you know, just really being intentional about when you look at it, like what would be distracting and then just take those distractions away, you know, and, and just be thinking through like, how can, can you make this look pleasant? How can you make this look like it fits into the rest of the wedding? So I think that's, yeah. And I'll say don't, don't do themed decoration, like, like music notes or something like it's, it's, it's not, a music event like it's it's the wedding so don't i've seen some like big big sign and don't don't do signs either please <laughs> yeah and that's a mistake that i i made um when i was first starting off is i thought that okay i need to have my my sign out and this was years ago so this was it's been a while since since i i did that but i thought to myself okay nobody here at this wedding um you know, needs to learn about me from being at this wedding. If, if they want to work with me, I need to prove myself and they'll come up and, and still they do like they'll ask for a card. You don't need to put your sign out, especially at a wedding. And um, I know DJs still do that from time to time because they think that it helps to put them, make them on brand. But I agree with you. I think that probably keep your sign away. <laughs> Um, are any other tips or, or tricks or, or things like that kind of in that mindset that you would recommend that people would do or, or something that they should consider if, if they're getting into the wedding business? Yeah, well, I think a big thing is that to realize that I know coming in as a DJ, we're entertainers and we you know kind of what works, but ultimately it's not our show. It's not us. Let me come in and show you what I do. It's getting to know how, how you can come in and what I, well actually my phrase that I use is celebration facilitation. So that's knowing what they're wanting and then making it happen so that you're, you are a person that's out there and you're making it fun for everyone, but it's not, you know, all about me. It's not, this is what I'm going to do. It's, it's putting the focus on the couple, but making it happen of what they're, of what they're wanting. And also really, getting because a lot of people they, they don't know what they want so just kind of question or learning about the 
the logistics of everything and questions to ask so that you're able to get an understanding of, of what they want, even if they don't specifically know what they want. So yeah, that, that's the thing. Uh, a, lo a lot of egos in the DJ industry, I would say, you know, check, check your ego and be willing to be a team player and, and make the whole, the whole day a success for the couple. Are there any tips that you could give us in the planning process? Is there anything that you do or questions that you ask when you are working with a couple to plan out the wedding? Um, any takeaways or, or things that we might be able to implement? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, really, you need to think about, um, well, what, well, here are a couple here. So I ask, you know, I always get them to, if I'm not doing voiceovers, recordings for them, then I always have them like just take a video on their phone to send me say everyone's name that I would be speaking about, including themselves, so that I know exactly how to pronounce everyone's names. So that's been easy for them. They just, you know, take a video on their phone and text it to me. And so I can practice. And that was, we, I had a wedding a few months ago and there was a, a groomsman who had, um, it was a very unique name. He was, um, I, I, I don't, it was something, something that I, that first and last name that, you know, I had never heard before. So I guess, I think it was, um, I, 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 a name I didn't know that wasn't a, a, a common or a, a name I was familiar with. But anyway, that was like a long description of what I was trying to say. So, <laughs> so um, a groomsman with a name that was probably hard to pronounce and I got to know how to say it ahead of time. So, you know, we're here lining up for introductions and I'm like, such and such, such and such. And then I said a name and he's like, that's my name. And that always stuck out in my head because it's like, you know, most people probably have never said his name correctly. And I was like, what? Your name's important. Like, I want to know how to say it. And that's what my, um, we, ha we had a wedding, a, a family member got married and I didn't even know the bridesmaid, but I, didn't, I had learned how to pronounce her name and, and the wedding band, the guy that was doing it, he was still pronouncing her name wrong. And I was like, Ugh. so like just taking the time to know how to say everybody's name. And that's, that's one of the biggest things I think. Yeah, and I think uh, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, one of the chapters he had was, you know, the sweetest sound of the human ear is your own name. So, you know, being able to capitalize on that, like people recognize that there's going to be a stronger connection between you and them because of, of just the sound of their own name. And to be able to give that gift to somebody is just so important. So I think that's uh, what, what a great takeaway and what a great gift that we can give, especially in this age now where connection is what is important. And that's why people are paying you is it's not just to show up and get the job done although that needs that needs to happen but the connection is what people are longing for and we have to go out of our way like you said like get that video get get it texted to you before the event so that you can have that in your mind so that when you're looking at it on the page yeah. you're not guessing that's the, yeah i still see that grooms makes you just like that's my name and so I'm like that's like that makes it just like it's so super important. I love it. Hey, so if you had a time machine and you could go back 10 or 20 years, you, you get to pick. Um, what is something that you would change? Or, or if you could go back and tell yourself something um, uh, just about the wedding industry or the DJ industry, yeah. what, what would you do? Honestly, I would love to, I guess, I guess learn more about software because from where I came up as a musician, I was. Um, not much into the the whole DJ software and it's kind of like I've kind of brought it on as needed so I would have loved to have really gotten more into that to begin with and and learn more especially back before I had kids to have time to really and take classes and the different DJ school stuff just the all the the functioning because I used to get you know, always did you know music lessons and piano lessons flute guitar lessons voice lessons all these lessons i would love to have you know actual time to do lessons with djing and learning all that because there's there's stuff that you're, you'll learn yourself but there's always something that somebody else can teach you and so that's that's something that you know i don't have now i'm not you know actively taking lessons from any anybody so i would love to have time to do lessons for that part so you mentioned um that you have kids um, what would you say to somebody who is, you know, who either has kids or is thinking about having kids? What is it like to do this and um, and still kind of have a family and still have time for them? Yeah, well, it's I mean, it's hard. It's it's a definitely a challenge. 
I mean, the main thing is, is you really have, you have to make it a profession and charge a professional fee because I mean, if it's, if it's just a hobby and you're gone, you know, 50 weekends out of the year, I mean, that's, that's not going to be much time. So it's a lot of sacrifice. So really, really making it where I, you know, I don't, I don't have to be gone every single weekend. You have chunks of time that's busier than others, but it's, I, I, yeah, just really making it, if you're going to be away, making it worth your time. That's good. And how old are your kids? So they are, all of them are getting ready to have their birthday coming up. So they will be 11, nine and four. What do they think about you being a DJ? What are their thoughts? Well, I think it's cool. I have my oldest son, I've, I've DJed a couple of his friends parties before. And, and so, um, and then my, my daughter, she thinks it's cool. She has her own little DJ set that she does. So we, so we went out to eat, um, a couple of days ago and there was this man carrying a little boy and she goes, Oh, his dad is carrying him. I wonder where his mom is. Maybe she's DJing. <laughs> It's like, she's like, oh, your uh, moms, they go away to DJ. That's what they do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. And that's really like, as we think about kind of the next generation of DJs, what what is something that you would want to pass on to them as you think about even maybe one day your kids being a DJ? Yeah. 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 So well, my, my middle son, he, for a while he was into DJ, like all he would wear was DJ shirts. And he actually, he got to go with me to like a, a little private wedding event and, and do some DJing. And Really, I mean, kind of like what I've said before, the just education and take music lessons. That's what they're, they're both in piano lessons. They do musical theater. Just really learn the theory of music. And that's something that I would say for everyone. And that's why I'm going to start writing some articles on it is, is the theory, music theory. And that's something that is so, it can translate to so much like through DJing or adding other do you want to add other elements into it? Just learning, just learning music theory. That's, that's my big thing is, you know, even if you want to get just like a, a primer level music theory book and just kind of start from the very beginning, it's, it's very, very helpful. Yeah. And personally, I've had uh, five semesters of music theory and I don't say that to brag, but um, I loved it. Like it was something that I was passionate about as a musician. And I didn't realize at the time that like the discipline of studying that was going to help me as a DJ. So I kind of did it by accident. <laughs> but I'm so grateful for it because, you know, and particularly for me, it's the rhythm. It's like, OK, the, you know, this song is going to is only going to have a bar of three and then it goes right back into four. Or it's like, OK, what what is going on with the rhythm of this 12 eight song that we're going to be transitioning into it maybe there's another 12 8 song and you have that kind of language whereas most people are thinking you know oh yeah it has a good beat which is just very generic and that doesn't really describe what's really happening in the architecture um so it's i i'm right there with you i think that music theory like i highly recommend it but of course as musicians we're like we we, we enjoy this so uh, i do though think that it's it's a fantastic um you know, investment of your time and it's going to help you when you least expect it. It's going to help you in those moments when you're like trying to solve a problem, you're going to have the answer. So um, last question for you and then we'll, we'll close out. Um, what's a goal that you're working toward right now? Like what's something that you're planning or that you're preparing for? So, yeah. So my goals, I want to be on, well, I, I love making mixes. So I really, I want to be on big, you know, national level, mix mix cloud or you know podcasts or whatever that that's really what I, I would love to be you know be featured on some of these and that's what I've, I've been kind of looking into and in some some different different avenues but that's that's really what I would would love to do and kind of be that big national radio DJ person love it Stacy yeah and I think that's that's fantastic and we're rooting for you and and we are just so excited that that is Awesome. Um, how can people find you if they want to find more information about you? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, Facebook and Instagram both are Stacy Randy DJ. And, and then Mixcloud is just my full name, Stacy Hawk Carroll. And so, and there, there's, if you can find one, you can find everything else. So there's, there's links to all of them on, on everything. So pick, pick one and then I'll be there. Sounds good. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Yeah, well, thank you. 
I want to thank you so much for being a listener of Wedding DJ School. You can find us over at WeddingDJSchool.com. Also, you can text Wedding DJ to 44222. We will ask for your email address, and in return, we will send you all of the podcast action guides for Season 1 of Wedding DJ School. So you can do that for free just by texting Wedding DJ to 44222. Lots of actionable advice that you can put to use right away, all for free. Well, we're going to continue talking with leaders in the wedding entertainment industry. We will be back next week with a new episode.